freedom and delirium. This is another clip from the film Edward Abbey, A Voice in the Wilderness. Here at Abbey explains the rationale behind direct action and protest. I regard defending the wilderness as something like defending your own home. I regard the wilderness as my home, my true ancestral home. And when it's being invaded by clear cutters and strip miners, I feel not only the right, but the duty, the moral obligation to defend it by any means I can. This last clip of Ed Abbey was recorded from a talk he gave at the University of Utah at an event hosted by the Sierra Club. Benediction. May your trails be crooked, winding, lonesome, dangerous, leading to the most amazing view. May your mountains rise into and above the clouds. May your rivers flow without end, meandering through pastoral valleys, tinkling with bells, past temples and castles and poets' towers, into a dark primeval forest where tigers belch and monkeys howl, through miasmal mysterious swamps infested with crocodiles, and down from there into a desert of red rock, blue mesas, domes and pinnacles and grottos of endless stone, and down, down again into a deep, vast, ancient, unknown chasm where bars of sunlight blaze on profiled cliffs, where deer walk across the white sand beaches, where storms come and go as lightning clangs upon the high crags, where something strange and more beautiful and more full of wonder than your deepest dreams waits for you beyond that next turning of the canyon walls. So long, I thank you very much. Yes, that is Ed Abbey speaking at the University of Utah. So how does it make you feel, Doug Peacock? You know, 20 years, I still miss him. How did you meet? Um, we met in Arizona and uh, at Bill Eastlake's house. William Eastlake was a great man of Southwestern letters. And uh, he invited me over uh, one cold evening and I drove a motorcycle and he was way out in the desert. And by the time I got to his house, I was shaking with the cold and I smoked cigarettes at the time. I had a little baggy of uh, bugler tobacco and I rolled a little joint like cigarette. But I shook so much I couldn't light it and this guy reached over and gave me a light, uh, this guy with this black beard. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm Edward Abbey, and uh, why don't you come and visit? He was a ranger down in Oregon Pipe, and uh, next week I went down there, good manners in those days, with a six-pack of beer and a bottle of gin or something, and uh, history. <laughs> Doug Peacock and Andrea Peacock are our guests today. Um, their book together, The Essential Grizzly, The Mingled Fates of Men and Bears, uh, Doug Peacock's book, Walking It Off, A Veteran's Chronicle of War and Wilderness. Uh, Juan Gonzalez and I will be back with Andrea and Doug in a minute. Luke Tan, watching the sun rise in Montana. We're taking an extraordinary trip around the country. We're in Bozeman, Montana. Last night we were at Montana State University. Tonight we'll be in Boise, Idaho. You can go to our website at democracynow.org to find out about this community voices, community tour, community media tour, and where we'll be in the coming days. And we're also looking for your suggestions for stories. As we travel around the country, you can email us at stories at democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman in Bozeman, Montana. Juan Gonzalez is in New York. Our guests today are Doug and Andrea Peacock. Their book together, The Essential Grizzly, The Mingled Fates of Men and Bears, Walking It Off is Doug Peacock's book, A Veteran's Chronicle of War and Wilderness. Juan, you've got a question. 
Uh, yes, Doug Peacock, I'd like to ask you, uh, you've been in, in some of your uh, writing and, and in your interviews of late, uh, so critical of the current environmental conservation movement in the country. Uh, could you talk about your concerns about where you see it's uh, 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 gone wrong? <clears throat> yeah, largely, I think it's tried to uh, be too polite too nice. It's tried to work with administrations like the Bush administration. Uh, it's tried to work with, uh, uh, with corporations and energy companies. And quite frankly, uh, uh, we can't do that anymore. I mean, the earth is in terrible shape. I mean, we, we've, the life support systems of, of, of air and ocean and temperature are going to pot in a hurry. And, um, you know, sp we're seeing a s extinction of species unprecedented. Even during the end of the Cretaceous, when you know, what the the great uh, paleo extinction did in the dinosaurs, today's rate is right there. Quite frankly, we're not radical enough. We're not angry enough. We're not militant enough. I mean, this should not be just a weekend meeting we go to. This this should be the heart of our lives, and uh, that's a lot to ask. I know these are tough times, but uh, the Earth just doesn't need it. We, as a species, our own survival, I believe, is also up for grabs just like the grizzlies. And, uh, you know, to survive is natural. We humans are so separated from, you know, the saber tooth that used to lurk in the, in, in the bushes or the grizzly on the mountain that uh, I don't think we get what's in our long-term self-interest for survival. Uh, do you have much hope now with the new o Obama administration and with the new Congress? I understand that it, this coming month, uh, uh, in May, there will be hearings in Congress on the new uh, Northern Rockies Ecosystems Protection Act, which is supposed to uh, possibly uh, protect millions of millions of acres uh, in the in the Northwest of, uh, of wilderness. Well, that's a great start, but it's really late in the game. You know, all you need to do is go outside and look at the top of the mountains here or any place around Yellowstone, and you'll see that our mountaintops are red. The reason they're red is because there's dead white bark pine trees up there. That is in the most dramatic example we've had in the Northern Rockies of global warming, and it's visible to anyone. You don't take a weatherman. White bark pine, which is the most important food for grizzlies in the Yellowstone ecosystem, is gone. No amount of science or management will bring it down. So I'm saying we're not going fast enough. The grizzly bear was delisted two years ago by the same federal agency that's re that was responsible for its best interest. And the delisting, that means taking it off the endangered species, was, you know, in my opinion, a, a political decision in defiance of the best available science that was not coincidentally made during the same time the Bush administration was absolutely denying global warming. Now, global warming has already taken the white bark. It's no longer going to be a significant food. We have mortality from human beings in the Yellowstone ecosystem we haven't ever seen in, in 40, 40 years. And uh, the reason there's so many dead bears is people kill them. They kill them because they're easy to kill because their value is less having been taken off the Endangered Species Act. The, uh, the, the federal agency administered and coordinated through the Federal Wildlife Service Department of Interior um, is totally incapable of dealing with this. They're the ones that delisted the grizzly. Their solution to the high mortality is uh, have the state start hunting licenses. You know, if you can kill a grizzly and sell a hunting license, maybe people will value the boar, the bear more and kill fewer grizzlies. I mean, that's a kind of logic I heard a week ago here in Bozeman <clears throat> from, again, this entity which is uh, designed to, you know, to save the grizzly, and it can't do it. The Department of Interior is going to have to either radically restructure or bring in brand new outside leadership. These people are, uh, it's an entity that's apart from our citizenry, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's been stolen from our democracy. This is a very insular, powerful group of mainly men who have lost their way, they've lost their mission, and they've lost their method.